So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about replication. Replication is something that humans are all very interested in. It's a lot of fun, but that's not really what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about how does replication get started and talk about both the industrial, well, that, that also is a game in itself, but um, <laughs> how does it get started? And if I could have my slides, please. So this is an ancient iPad. It, <laughs> if you had one of these, you would have been the person to talk to in the ancient past. This device, uh, if, if you had it intact, would have been about the size of a book. You'd turn a knob on the side, and you'd be able to predict the motions of the planets, you'd be able to tell where lunar eclipses were going to happen, solar eclipses were going to happen. You would uh, be able to know when the next Olympic Games were going to take place. It was a very cool device for its time. It was found off the coast of Antikythera, that's why it's called the Antikythera Mechanism, that's in the lower right. And it's believed to have come from Syracuse, which is the home city of Archimedes, who may have had a role in its manufacture. And it was written about by the ancients as quite a remarkable thing. So 100 years after the fall of Syracuse, it was, it was sacked by the Romans. Cicero, a Roman, is going to a dinner party and he's talking about this device. Somebody brings it out. A, a grandfather had taken it away from Syracuse and he's talking about a globe that can do precisely all of the things that this mechanism that I just showed you on the first slide could do. And its manufacturer attributed to Archimedes. So when you look inside of it, it's got gears. There's at least 39 of them. Some of them are just gone because this thing has been sitting at the bottom of the ocean for 2,000 years. So why don't we all have such mechanisms? Why is it that we're walking around now with, with uh, iPads? rather than uh, this mechanical device. So technological advance has really given us something new. This particular device, there really are not that many copies of them. Maybe 10 of them were made around Archimedes' time. So in order to try to understand that a little bit better, I wanted to take apart my wife's iPad because I'd like to compare it to this ancient device and sort of see what you know, what 2,000 years has actually given us. And she just looked at me and said, well, no, you're not going to do that. Why don't you go to Rona and buy something else that you can dismantle? <laughs> so we, <laughs> we went to Rona, as instructed. And this was about the cheapest thing I could find that looked complicated. It's just a Noma moon ray that you stick in the side of your lawn so that you can see the path. It's 249, pretty cheap. All right, so if you take this apart, though, there's remarkable complexity inside of it. There's three plastic moldings. There's two clear moldings, one of which has been coated, so it's reflective. There's two metal fabrications. There's four fasteners that hold the whole thing together. There's at least 16 electrical parts. Okay, some of them are pretty trivial, like wires, but some of them are really quite complicated. The battery is relatively complicated. The bulb-like thing in the middle is an LED, also light-sensitive, quite complicated. I mean, you can't just make that in your basement. There's a solar cell in the lower right there. And all of these pieces you can get for $249. You could not have got the Antikythera device for that amount of money. All right, so there's 27 parts in here. 39 parts that we know of in the Antikythera device. When you look at this particular gizmo, you see evidence for maybe 10 suppliers, all right? That these parts came from 10 different manufacturers than the manufacturer that actually put this thing together. And that would look something like a web of, of this form. All of these manufacturers feed their product into this one thing that you then buy for 249. Right, so the screws, for example, they could be used by other manufacturers for a variety of things. The LED bulb, it has many different products that you can recognize inside the bulb that would be used to make the bulb that came from other manufacturers. And then if you look at the moldings, you see something quite interesting, and, and the screws and a number of other things. You can actually see hints as to how they were actually made. If I just focus on the molding, this is just a blow up of one of the plastic parts. It was made by an injection mold. That means there was another thing that made this. It was metal. You put it together, you squirt plastic into it, and you get this thing. But you can see how that metal mold was made just by looking at this. You see these circles in the middle there. That's from the end of an end mill that you would use to remove the metal in the metal part of the mold so that you can actually make this thing, so that you can make this plastic thing. So there's one level back, which is the mold, 
that makes this. And then there's one level back from the mold, which was actually making the mold. And so you see evidence of how that primary technology was actually making the mold. So it's an end mill. Here's a picture of one. Pretty much every machine shop in the world will have one of these. This is a manual one. Of course, there's computer controlled ones now. But 200 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution was taking off, you would have found something like this. A little bit more primitive, but pretty much the same kind of technology. This thing has a rotating cutting head, which is being lit up by this bulb uh, in the middle of the picture that actually removes the metal from the thing that you're trying to work on. And it has a bed that you can move in all three dimensions. So if you can move that bed very precisely, you can make pretty much any shape that you want. All right, and um, if you look underneath that bed, you can see something called a lead screw. That lead screw, which is just a screw, is a very precise helix. Okay? And that precision is critical for making something like an end mill so that you can actually remove things with a thousandth of an inch precision over respectable lengths. So if you turn this handle, you'll move the bed to the left by a quarter of an inch if you turn it exactly once. So where did these lead screws come from? And the first device that actually makes the manufacture of lead screws and actually itself possible is the industrial machine lathe. And this is a picture in another corner of the SFU machine shop of an industrial hand-operated lathe. All right, and just to take you through what this lathe does, it mounts a piece of work on the red chuck, which has that red circle in the middle top. It mounts a piece of work and it rotates it. And as it's rotating, you slide a tool against the work so that you can remove pieces of metal. And that's basically all it is. And as it's sliding on this carriage, which is in the middle of the picture with the handle, it's sliding along a very precise bed. And that bed defines a one-dimensional line that as it's sliding along that one-dimensional line, you can make the tool move along that same line very precisely. And as it's doing so, it's sliding past this lead screw, which is on the bottom along the side of the bed there. And if it engages with that lead screw, as you turn the lead screw, you can move the tool with respect to the work in a predictable way. Just to finish how this thing works, as the lead screw goes into a housing where there's a whole set of gears, I'm not showing most of them, just in the lower left you can see some of the external gears, those gears, which we saw in the Antikythera device, those gears would link the lead screw and this device to the rotating work. So you can actually have the lead screw turning at a certain rate and the work turning it at another. If you build one of these devices for the first time and it's precise enough, you can build another lathe with it. So this machine right here, you can build another lathe. All right? But before you have that, you can't build a lathe. And that is the sort of catalytic trigger for getting everything to work. All right? So how do you do that? I mean, it should be possible, kind of trivially, for me to build part of a lathe. So I asked the machinist, can I build part of your lathe using this? And he said, well, you can't, but I will. And um, <laughs> uh, here's a little movie. So here's the lead screw. It's sliding along that precision bed, which is above, the metal above, and it's pulling the carriage, which holds the cutting tool, towards the end of the lathe. All right? That lead screw is the precision part. The bed is a precision part. Archimedes didn't have either one of those things. The lead screw is being turned, and it's connected to a gear that then is connected to the work that's rotating. And if I want to make another lead screw, I have to turn the work at exactly the same rate as uh, the lead screw. So now the machinist has engaged the tool. Now I'm looking down on, on the work, and here's the cutting tool actually just removing metal. And all the machinist does is just bring the tool back to the start, engage the cutting operation, and the machine does the rest. And it's just making a new lead screw right there. This took him no more than about 20 minutes. Okay? So here's Admittedly, the lead screw here is out of aluminum, and the actual lead screw that's at the bottom is made out of a hardened steel, but you get the idea. So you take, he takes the lead screw that he's just made that's on the bottom off. Here's the lead screw on the machine, and they mate perfectly. All right? And so that's an intrinsic feature of the Industrial Revolution that didn't happen before that. You couldn't just make anything you wanted. You had to be an artist. Here you can just make something that is precise, and that is the fundamental parts of a machine that can replicate. Just to summarize that, if we look at, down the left column, we have gears, which I showed you, which are ancient, precision sliding surfaces that were made in the very early Industrial Revolution, and a precision lead screw, and you can make another one, I just showed you that. But likewise, you can take a precision sliding surface and gears and make a precision sliding surface, 
And if you take gears and a precision lead screw, you can make gears. And if you look at the bottom, you can make many of these things from the three things that are the input. Okay? So the ind Industrial Revolution got going because of the fact that you could make these three critical objects, one of them really ancient and that Archimedes had, but two new guys. And together, those three are all that you need to make a machine that can keep going. All right, so Archimedes lacked replication. If you had replication, you would have had a mechanical gizmo back in the ancient times that you could buy, and probably it would cost $249. If I summarize this slightly differently, precision tools of the sort that I just showed you, whether they're manual, manually operated or computer controlled, as they're increasingly, sit at the top of a pyramid. They're, they're the most precise objects that humans know how to make. And then tool and die manufacturers use those things to make subsets of tools that go on to spawn all of the catalysis that you need to make machines for the routine endeavors that we all go about, cars, whatever it is, literally everything that we touch. This web of manufacturing companies can expand and, and in principle contract, though really over the last 200 years it's only expanded, it can expand at will and is only ever limited by the resources that it has to actually build itself because we have an exponential way of building the tools that are the catalysts for the whole web of manufacturing. All right, so this is exactly like what living systems do. So we have really two main types of life. There's the sort of more fundamental one, which are cells, and we also have viruses. We have three branches of living things. What's remarkable about them is that they're all almost identical. They're just basically different brands of the same thing. At their core, their metabolism is all virtually identical, right? So this slide here is just showing the core of central metabolism. I don't want you to see anything about it, but it's a complicated web of interacting catalysts that just takes substrates, just like a manufacturer would take a screw from one company and use it in a different product. It might manipulate the screw someplace along the line, but each of these arrows is a manipulation of something going to someplace else, and that's what keeps us all alive. So when we think about that, the natural question is it's neat, we like it, but where did it, how did it get going? And just like for machines, we believe we have a theory. Unfortunately, because the origin of life was about three and a half billion years ago, we don't really have as many details as we have about what got machines replicating. So what we think happened was a molecule called the RNA was ancient, was invented by some non-biological process. And that was sufficient to set up a replicative path where the output of the RNA process could be fed into the input and got an autocatalytic process going. And that gave rise to RNA that could make proteins, which is what happens in all of our cells today. And those proteins were just really good catalysts. And they allowed the invention of DNA, which we now use for the repository of our genetic information. So this ancient RNA world, as it's called, is the, the leading theory that we have for how very early autocatalysis worked. So here's RNA. Here's two base pairs. Here's an RNA helix. And intrinsically, each of the strands of the RNA encodes the other. So if you can make one, and you can fill in the other, you've duplicated something. And that's one of the beautiful things about nucleic acid. So one of the other leading features about RNA is that it makes shapes. Here's a machine now, not something that can encode code information, but this machine can join two pieces of RNA together. So we took that machine, used a process called in vitro selection, which mimics biological selection, and I won't have a, an opportunity to explain this slide, but if you imagine <laughs> selecting one object out of 10 to the 15, this in vitro selection can do that. So one way to imagine that is to fill this up with sand, the entire stadium, label one of the particles as the special solution you want, and dig through the stadium until you find it. <laughs> okay, so in vitro selection allows you to do that rapidly in about a period of a week. So what we found is that we take this molecule, I'm now showing in a more schematic way the three-dimensional structure of that machine that joins two RNAs together as a line drawing of the actual nucleotide sequence. We managed to find a particular RNA that actually can extend an RNA template. And what this does is it just fills in a piece of RNA. And so here's a single-stranded RNA helix. And in a moment, it will fill in on the right. And on the left is a gel that's showing exactly the same thing, but from the point of view of how my students actually would measure it. So this 
filling in operation, which is fundamental to replication, we've nearly got going in the laboratory. We'd like to close the loop in the sense that we could actually make more RNA of the same sort as what we start with. And at the moment, we're able to extend about two turns of an RNA helix, and we're trying to evolve a system where we could get a closed loop where you can grow an RNA population that you could call, in principle, alive in a test tube. So there's a clear comparison between industrial and biological replication. Industrial replication is really powerful. It's already caught up to all of the things that biological life can do. We're sort of on par with what biology on this planet can do right now. There's clear implications for how exponential growth can affect that. I guess my take home message really is replication, which is an exponential process, is really hard to control. And we've invented a new one as humans 200 years ago. We're only just starting to see the consequences of it. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you.